recursion uses uh, recursion as I said earlier recursion uses itself to you know uh, calculate the result for factorial as you see in one factorial it gets the result one and uses it to calculate two and then uh, you know this goes on all the way to the top caller whoever the root is in the you know recursion tree uh, and you know if you implement it in a nice fashion uh, for the recursive implementable applications or algorithms this provides an elegant and nice you know result which is easily understandable by you know looking into the code if you look into this Fibonacci or factorial code as we have written it is really simple and shows the idea it calls itself and you know you see how it is actually operating in more detail in the code easily so that's the so that's the most important part of recursion and you know we have to uh, use it as it is available a method a method in Java a method in Java a method in Java can invoke itself uh, you know which creates a recursive method however uh, you can also have an indirect recursion which is provided by let's say uh, you know you have a, you have a method you have a method A that calls B which calls C let's say and then that calls D you can have a link such that and then this at the end calls A again let's say this is in a sense indirect recursion you know which in which case you're basically calling itself after some other methods being called in the middle so you're going to be able to uh, call the same method over and over using you know internal method implementations in the middle okay so uh, the overhead of this is again called indirect recursion okay can you follow now so uh, you have to have the recursive method call such that you have the base case and then the recursive step as well in your implementation so these two must be there and in each method call as we did the Fibonacci what happens is that the processor puts all the registers to a side of the previous caller such as this one and then reallocates a space for the new method call which is the Fibonacci 4 so it basically creates a new space for the new call for the same method even though it's the same name it is totally a different method call which is going to allocate a different memory uh, in execution on the processor so basically you are creating additional overheads by calling the method over and over in a recursive fashion so this has an overhead it's not cheap to uh, you know allocate a space for the new method call and re-execute it with the new method and then you create another one here another one there which you know uh, pushes the registers of the processor to the memory and pops them up back whenever it is time to compute the remaining part of this Fibonacci okay so as if you remember the call stack that I mentioned to you if you look into the call stack of this basically what's gonna happen is that it will start with Fibonacci 5 at the bottom and then you will save its uh, state onto the memory right whatever it is currently have in terms of local uh, variables whatever uh, you know you need to save related to this Fibonacci 5 you have to save it since you're going to execute a new uh, new method which is in this case Fibonacci 4 right so it will basically uh, try to execute 4 but however to execute that it will go into Fibonacci 3 and it will go Fibonacci 2 and so on so before you know you can proceed with this Fibo 5 you have to finish all these and you have to save all these methods states and that's going to create an overhead which is if you can implement things in a linear implementation uh, which is not preferred to write them in recursive manner okay that's the overhead of recursion although it provides an elegant solution it is expensive to implement recursive methods in terms of execution latencies and also uh, mem memory constraints uh, recursive methods are costlier than normal regular algorithms or iterative algorithms that you implement
So if you consider the computation of sum of numbers from 1 to n, you can write it such that uh, i1 to n, uh, sigma i1 to n is equal to n plus, you know, i sigma i1 to n minus 1. So you can just write a, a recursive implementation of the same you know, method for this summation of 1 to n. Obviously, you can write it in, a, in an iterative fashion as well, uh, which is, you know, uh, up to you. However, you have to define the problem in a recursive manner first before going into implementing it in a recursive algorithm. So if you look into this algorithm for summing uh, up the numbers from 1 to n, as you see, in public int sum int num, so it takes an integer as an argument and result as a result returns the sum of the uh, numbers from 1 to that number and you have the if number equals 1 the base case result is equal to 1 else result is equal to num plus sum n minus 1 in this case what you do is you have a recursive call for the sum method over again with one less uh, value as an argument and at the end you return the result when you find it okay so when you call sum 5, basically what you do is you call 5 plus sum 4, right? So it's same thing with the factorial. And then you have 4 sum 3. And then you have, right, if you continue like that, you'll get all the way to the bottom where you reach the base case. And then you have 3 and then sum 2 and you have 2 and then sum 1. So sum 1 is going to give you 1 and then you will all the way go up to the recursion hierarchy, recursion 3 and execute the final result. So basically this indicates how it operates. Here same thing in graphical fashion. So you have the sum 1 which gives you a result 1 and then you get the uh, result for this part which is sum 2 for 3 and then you get the result for sum 3 which gives you 3 plus 3 as a 6 at the end and you'll return to the main method call for the same recursive application. Um, if uh, it, it doesn't mean that if you're able to solve a problem in a recursive manner it doesn't mean that you should be solving it recursively. Again, uh, there are the overheads that uh, are related to the implementing of uh, recursive algorithms. Uh, also, you know, um, there, are the, there may be other constraints that you need to be careful in implementing recursive algorithms, such as the memory. So in this case, sum of 1 to n problem is very simple to solve iteratively. You should probably avoid implementing it in a recursive manner. Again, if it is not too complex and you can write it uh, in a recursive, uh, in an iterative fashion, such as using a for loop, you would probably want to do it using an iterative fashion. What do I mean by iterative? How can you write the iterative version of the sum? How are you going to write it? It's basically simple, right? So you will have a for loop for int i equals 0 or i equals 1 since the number was from 1 to and then i less than or equal to n i plus plus right and then you will say sum plus i if I initialize sum to be 0 initially and then every time I add i to it right I will get the sum of numbers from 1 to n by having such a loop or you could just simply use the mathematical expression to evaluate that too right so it's uh, it's up to you however as I said earlier if you can write the code in an iterative fashion such as this one it's always better to uh, better in terms of performance but recursion provides elegant implementation however for some problems recursion provides an elegant solution often cleaner than an iterative solution in those cases you may prefer this uh, recursive solution and for specific instances you need to uh, you need to find out what is the best solution for implementing it uh, 
as I said earlier, uh, both in terms of mathematical implementations or uh, evaluations, they may require the same amount of work, such as here in this case you have an addition for each number, and then for this case you are going to need an addition for each number as well, in terms of number of additions. However, the problem is not with the operations that you are performing, the problem is with the uh, summation operation or summation method being created and called and whenever you call a method what's going to happen is that uh, the processor is going to invoke this method save the state of the previous method such as let's say you called sum5 as you see sum5 is not finished when you call sum4 so you you basically have this line of code which you go here execute this come back in the recursion however this is so deep that you go execute another one, you go execute another one, and so on. So all of these method calls and coming backs cause the main overhead. It is not that the operations, the summations cause this problem, but rather method calls, invoking them, setting up the necessary space for the method, and then whenever the method finishes execution, you know, returning back to the caller method is the main overhead. And in, for example, in this application, you may see, I don't know the exact numbers, but at, at least 5x difference in terms of performance between this one and this one. This would be five times slower, at least, if you do it, uh, implement it using method calls, method invocations. Again, recursion, why do I, why do I prefer to use recursion? The main reason is because you would like to see an elegant solution. Whenever you look at the code, oh, that's what they are trying to do, you will understand. And programming is a lot easier. You can write the program very easily, as we did the factorial. Otherwise, with factorial, we would have had a longer code to write in, in, in order to implement the same thing. Does it answer your question? So, uh, as I said earlier, uh, you may have an indirect recursion such as let's say M1 invoke M2 and M2 invokes M3 which in turn invokes M1 again so you have recursion if, uh, if you have a cyclic behavior in the color of the in the order of the calling methods then you will see a, a recursion which is indirect if you remember uh, the regular recursion let's say A calls itself is basically having a cyclic uh, call something like this however if you have a a chain that is A calls B and B calls A, this is again going to be a recursion, in which case it is going to be an indirect recursion. So as you see, M1, M2 calls M3, and then M3 calls M1 again, M2, M3, and then calls M1 again, and over and over. So this is also a recursion, uh, which is harder to debug. So if there is a problem, if there is a problem somewhere in between, let's say M1, M2, and M3, you will have a problem in you know, uh, debugging it because uh, it's harder to understand where the thing actually happened, which one uh, is the cause of the, may, the problem, and so on and so forth. So using recursion, if you, uh, for example, would like to use recursion to find a path through a maze, so for each location, we can search in each direction. So you can search from each location to each direction. And then uh, in, um, recursive, in a recursive fashion, what you do is that you keep track of the path through the maze. And uh, in, uh, at the beginning, if you look in the base case, is an invalid move or reaching the final destination. So it could be either an invalid move, such as let's say you have a maze uh, that is Let's say this is the maze, and then you would like to, although you are here, you would like to move up. This is an, you know, invalid move which you cannot perform, right? So that's going to uh, be the base case, or reaching the destination is also the base case. So remember, one thing that you have to do is uh, the base case, what is going to be your base case, and the second thing is the recursive step. The base case needs to be a final destination which no longer will uh, re, you know, rerun the same method over again and the uh, iterative state will obviously be, will be calling the same method over and over. So here, if you're here, there are four options for the 
uh, traversal, you can go this way, that way, up and left. So basically this is going to call all the possible invocations and then try to exploit uh, anything possible to go. So let's open up the maze search and maze java. So as the, na as the beginning, you know, uh, this is a good way of implementation. So whenever you write your code, you, you want to have a header which explains what's going on in the, uh, in the file. And this is what is explaining here. As it says, represents a maze of characters. The goal is to get from the top left corner to the bottom right, following a path of ones. So basically, it's indicating a maze, which is composed of zeros and ones, as you see. And this is composed of you know, uh, if you follow the ones, you will find the route to the destination. So basically, if you see, uh, this will be stuck with this one, so you have to go here, and then this will be the path, and this one, and where this way, and then this one, no, this way, no, okay, and then this one will get you to the destination. So basically, it is going to try to go. Uh, all the ways and find the destination. So uh, initially try three and then you have a uh, path seven, right? So it's going to attempt to recursively traverse the maze, insert special characters indicating locations that have been tried and that eventually become part of the solution. So it will update the certain values such as uh, here as you see Boolean, public Boolean, traverse, int, row, int, column. So it's going to start with the position 0, 0, and then we'll try to traverse as you go with the maze, right? Boolean done, false. And then if valid row, column. So if the row and column is valid values, such as uh, if they're uh, positive values, and it, if they're within the limits of your uh, within the limits of your maze, meaning that what's the limits of your maze? You're not supposed to go, how many entries you have here? 5, 8, and then 12. So it shouldn't be greater than 11 in uh, this dimension. And then also it shouldn't be greater than 3, 4, uh, 7 on the y dimension, right? So if you look into the valid, see it checks for the validity int row, int column, boolean result false, if row is greater than 0 and row is less than grid.length, so whatever the number of entries there, and column is greater than 0 and column is less than grid row.length, so it checks for both dimensions whether the row and column values are valid values, if both of them are valid, if row and both column are valid, then you're going to say check if the cell is not blocked and not previously tried, if this column is equal to 1, and also, in that case, you can say that it is going to be true, right? Because that means you have not tried that before, and also you have uh, the, the, uh, the location is uh, allowed to go through. So it's not a blocked location. So initially, it starts with, if you look into here, zeros will prevent that to be a valid move, right? So basically, it checks every move, whether it's a valid move or not, by first checking the boundary conditions with the first if, and the second if checks whether you're allowed to move to that location. Okay? So basically, it indicates um, initially, if you remember, you had the 1, 1, 1, right? So it's going to, if it checks this one, it's valid in terms of the bound checks, and also it's valid since it is not blocked, since it has a 1 there. So it is basically going to return true if both of these conditions are satisfied. Otherwise, it will start with false and finish with false, returning a false result at the end. So this is checking for the valid, and then this is just a two-string method, which prints, the, uh, which prints the maze at the end. And if you look into the traverse again, so basically what we do, we check for the valid move, 
if the current move is valid, what are we going to do? We are going to change the grid row column by tried. What was the value of tried? It was 3, so that it is different from 1 and 0. So you can set it something else if you like. However, it's set here tried, which is going to basically indicate that that has been tried before. And then if row is equal to grid dot length minus 1 and column grid 0 length minus 1, done true. So the maze is solved. This is the base case. Right? If you have reached the destination, meaning that row and column is the rightmost uh, bottom corner, this corner, you have reached the destination, so you return true. Otherwise, done is equal to traverse row plus one column. So you try the down. If not done, if this is not going to give you a solution, you're going to traverse row column plus one, so that you're going to go to the right. So it first, uh, from this point, whatever the, what is the first thing that you're doing? Basically, you have this corner that you're starting with. The first thing that you're going to try is this bottom. If I'm going to be able to get to, to a solution by this, am I going to be able to get to a solution? You, you can never get to a solution, right? Because you're always going down, so you'll reach to the bottom, uh, which, in which case you're not going to be able to proceed anymore. And in that case, you will move to right, for example. Even if you have all these ones available there. And then you're going to uh, traverse row minus one column, so it will try up. And then it will try left, right? So every time you're going to call the traverse method over and over. So once you reach here, this point, the first thing that you're going to try is again down. So if you look into the numbers, so let me write that so that you will have a better understanding. One, 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 and then you have. 0, 1, 1, right? 0, 0, 0. What is the next thing? 1, 0, 1. Three ones. 0, and then 4, 1. Okay, the third row, I'm not going to continue that far. Zero, 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 zero. And then you have one. So let's start with the leftmost corner. So it, uh, what does it do? It checks for the, uh, for the first time, it checks for the down. So it's going to check with this one, right? And then it will uh, go, uh, try to go from this point, traverse. It will call the traverse method with what? So if you look into here, it will call the traverse method with row plus one and then the column, which is again going to try to check this. How, how, what's going to happen here once it is going to call this method? It is going to call due to if valid row column once it is called for this one, right? Since it is zero, this validity will validity check will tell you that, hey, it's false, and then it's not going to go into that if, which in which case it is going to basically uh, uh, return this done value, which is false. So it's not going to be able to proceed with this and then return back here. So in that case, it will be back up here if not done. So it's not done yet, in which case it will try right. So it will try this. However, this is going to tell you that, again, it is not valid, so it will come back to here again. And it will say, hey, then try this if it is not done. Up. So it will go up again. OK? And then until it finds a valid way through, it will continue traversing all different options and find uh, the way to, to the end of the maze. Why not? Yes, true, yeah. It will not going to be able to go to the uh, up because it is already tried, so it will update this uh, grid row column with the tried before going in there. You're right, yeah. 
So it's not going to basically go up. And then uh, it will try again uh, left. Since left does not exist, it will not go anywhere from this point on, which is, return, which is going to return false because you will come here as initially it was set to false, right? Nothing is updated this time for this point. And then you will return back with a false coming you back to the original uh, starting point. And then here, again, the bottom didn't work, so you couldn't go down. Next thing that you will try is going right, right? So you'll go here. And for this one, you will try bottom again, the down. It's not going to work since this is not valid because it's zero. And then it will try right, so it will come to here. And then it will try down. It will work because it's, uh, you know, uh, available. And then it will try down. It will be false. It will try this. And this will be uh, the next thing. And it will try down. It will be false. And it, it is going to try. The next one is right again. So it will try this. Right. right. And then what's going to happen? It will try down. And then you will come here. Then what's going to happen? It will try down. What is uh, on that path here? There's one again. So it will try that one. You get the idea until you hit a invalid, you know, invalid uh, b b location. You will go until you can reach to the last point. If you cannot reach anywhere from there, you'll backtrack and come back to the original location. The worst case could be what's going to happen is that you will not reach anywhere and then you will back, uh, get back to the original starting point which may have no solution for the maze, right? So let me execute this and then if you look into the maze search, uh, it says labyrinth traverse zero zero, so it starts with the point zero zero and then goes all the way to the end, tries to traverse it. If it can find, it will return the maze was successfully traversed and then in the second case, there is no possible path if it doesn't uh, find a solution. As you see, when it says system out print line labyrinth, it is going to basically print out the result at the end. So if I compile and execute this, so as you see, it is shown with sevens the path that is actually the solution. So if you look into the path, as you see, seven, 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 and then you have seven, and you have seven here, sevens, and then you go up, and then you go here, come there, come here go up and then below and you finally reach to the target. So this is the original maze and then the maze is successfully solved. So if I happen to modify, for example, if I d uh, break this maze such that, let's say if I put a zero here, do I break it? Right? I will break it. So as you see, uh, it has shown the tried paths with trees and then that's all it can go there. There's no other way it can move from and it says uh, there's no possible path. So basically uh, this part is isolated so it cannot uh, reach from uh, that point to any other location which will stop it. Okay. So this is a this is a you know recursive implementation which shows how powerful it may be if you use it in the proper fashion, right? So it's <coughs> it's uh, providing a nice solution by going through traversing all different four possibilities in this case. Remember, in our factorial, how many different possibilities we had? We had only one option, right? Which was call calling the factorial itself over and over. However, in this case, you have four other uh, ways to go uh, in a uh, in a recursive fashion. So in your recursive tree, every time you have four different leaves going out of your root. So it will have this root initially, uh, which is going to be down, right, right, up and left. And then from this one, you will have also all those options. At some point, you will be, you know, um, you will be blocked and you will not be able to go anywhere from that point on and you will need to traverse back up to the um, uh, up to the recursion hierarchy. Any question?
It is not traversing over the same points it has traversed before. So if you look into the code, uh, the question was, what would happen if uh, there is a cyclic path which, the, um, which you may need to traverse? What's going to happen? If you look into this uh, tried case, it you know, assigns three to those points where you have gone before. So it's not going to uh, be able to go to those points if they are tried. How do we check that? The valid checks that. If this is not equal to 1, it is not going to go in there. So tried is equal to 3, so it will mark those points. Let's say you have a cyclic implementation, such as uh, here in this case, let's say you have 1, 1, 1, and then you have 1, 1, 1, 1, and then you go up here. Let's say this is the cyclic pattern that you have, which which is all surrounded with zeros, so it's going to have a cyclic path. However, when it tr tries to traverse, it's going to basically assign these as trees, right? And then whenever it comes here, it will mark this as tree, and then we'll try to go somewhere. However, it cannot go anywhere because this is also set to be a traversed path so far, which is not going to be a valid move for this point. Okay. Any question? Towers of Hanoi, before going into Towers of Hanoi, it's uh, a little bit uh, different problem. I'd like to do a couple of other uh, recursive uh, algorithms. So, for example, if you remember, we said that... Do you remember the polyndrome example? So, polyndrome is, uh, is a word or a sentence or a phrase uh, that will be read same as the original one, if you read it from the reverse, if you read it in a reverse fashion, it is going to be able to, you know, uh, it is going to be the same thing such as kayak, right? So let's, if you want to write a method that checks recursively for palindrome strings. So if, let's say I'd like to write a method, you're asked to write, write a recursive method which returns whether a string given as an argument is a palindrome or not, as a Boolean result. So basically you are going to write a Boolean returning method, public, static let's say, Boolean is palindrome. And then this takes a string, let's say str. So I'd like to write this in a recursive fashion such that this returns me whether the given string is palindrome or not. However, I'd like to write this in a recursive fashion. How can I write this? So we need to have a base case. So let's say this is kayak. What you're going to do is that basically uh, the, uh, the base case is going to be what? So what could be the base case? So the base cases actually there are two base cases, right? One is if you have one character in the middle, if it is the length of the string is uh, odd, you will have one string. If you have only one uh, character left, then it's definitely a palindrome. So you will return true for that, right? If str dot length is equal to what? One, what will I return? Let's say I give as a string as a. It is a palindrome, right? Return true. What's the other base case? Else,
If you have more than one characters, what are you going to look into? Let's say AB. As if str dot length is equal to two, what are you going to say? Return false. Return str char at zero equals str char at 1. So basically, if this is true, you will return true. If this is false, you will return false. And then, else, in other cases, such as, for example, cat, what are you going to return? Anything, anything else can be written from this point on by just checking, as you said, with substrings, right? You can use this else return, again, str char at 0 equals str char at, char at str length length minus 1 so that you get the first and last uh, last characters is it sufficient no you will say and what are you going to say you call the same method with is palindrome and then you will just give the new substring which is going to be str dot substring and then you will give the substrings starting point and end point starting point is going to be equal to one and then you'll go all the way to the str dot length minus one Minus one is not inclusive, remember? Is it going to be minus two or minus one? Minus one, right? So this is, let's say, this is going to be str dot. So this is zero, this is one, this is two, which is length minus one. However, you would like to start with the first entry, which is 1, and then you go all the way to substring 1, 1. Right? Sorry, 1, 2. You start with 1, and then 2 is not included in the substring. Remember, this is uh, not including 2. So it will just have uh, the f character 1, which is A. So basically, this is going to return you uh, the true or false according to going in, you know, smaller and smaller. So it will start with kayak, right? And then it will check for the f last, last condition. It will see that these two are same. And then it will check for this new palindrome. This palindrome method will take Aya as the argument and then it is going to check for the first and last. They are equal, and then it will call it with y. And the base step will be executed here. So you have y. If the length is equal to 1, you will return true. So this will return true. Since these were equal and this returns true, this whole thing will return true. And then since this whole thing is true, and then you have k and k at the beginning and end, it will also return true at the final result at the end. Okay? 
Any question? So let's say if I'd like to write in a recursive fashion power of method. This is really easy. So let's say I would like to write public static int and then I have uh, power and I have int x and int y. So which takes x to the y? So if you would like to write it in a recursive fashion, how are you going to write it? Obviously it is not smart to write it this way, but just fun of it. Let's try to write. So what is the base case? If x equals 1 is the base case or y equals 1, right? If y equals 1, return x. Else Uh, forget the extreme cases with you know uh, zeros and all the numbers. So assume that it's really a nice positive two numbers for x and y. Else, you're going to return. Basically, you'll multiply x times, and then you will call power with x and then y minus one. Right, so this is going to give you, again, ignoring the negative or zero values, so you can deal with those separately if you'd like. And for example, what else? Uh, recursive. Um, did we do anything else you want to write recursively that you can think of? How is polyndrome? How do you want to implement it? You can do that, that's fine, but you know, it's the same recursion and same, uh, there's nothing interesting in doing that. You can write that, so. So if you want to, for example, search an element in an array, let's say in a linear search, how can you write that? So let's say public static, let's say uh, boolean is found. And then you have an int, okay, array, x, and then int key, and you have int start and int end. So basically what this does is, for example, if you'd like to search for a specific key in a given array, which is x here, and then the key is given, uh, within the indexes start, and then you have the last index as end. And you'd like to search within this range for your element. So initial call to this method call would be, uh, let's say you're given an array uh, is found. I will give the array name, let's say I have an integer array A, and then I have a key K, and I'd like to start to search within this array uh, as, a, as a whole thing, and I will start with the first element the zero and then I will go all the way to the last element which is going to be a dot length minus one. So this is my first method call let's say and I'd like to find k in this array a and this is the method call that I'd like to write it in a recursive fashion. How can you write this? Basically you are going to first try to find it 
right? If you're going to uh, do it in a recursive fashion, you have a f uh, you have to have a base case, right? So you will see if, how are we going to proceed? So every time I will have a smaller array, smaller and smaller arrays. So I will start with index 0 and go all the way to the last element. And then the next call could be, for example, I will have one and the last element. Let's say L is the length. And then I will search in 2 and L and so on. What's the base case? If I find it in the first element that I'm searching, I will return it as true. If, for example, in this case, x start is equal to my key return true. Else, I will say return, what am I going to say, is found and then I will have, again I will have x, I will have key, I will have start plus 1 and then I will have the end. However, is it is it solved yet? Uh, when is it going to stop? If if it finds uh, in the first entry, it's going to stop. Is it is it solved in this way? If I cannot find anything, right? If if the key exists in the array, then this is going to work fine. It will find it somewhere, either at the beginning or somewhere in the middle or at the end. It will return the result uh, as a Boolean, uh, uh, as a uh, true or false. However, otherwise, I need to check that too. So you have to have a condition where you check whether um, you have the last element and then it is not found. You'll need to return false. So you will have to have an else statement in here which checks else if x start or you don't need to have this uh, else if what am I going to say else if how are you going to get the condition if start equals and return false. Why is this going to work? Because if the key is not found in the last entry, you will not be able to return true and then you will move into the, the else part, which means if your start and end is the same and you haven't found it yet, then you're, you're, you're not going to be able to find it, in which case you'll return false. Okay? You can go and, uh, you know, uh, look for it again. However, we will continue tomorrow with the remaining recursive algorithms.